we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, uh, so you may be wondering uh, why would I pick speci specifically to talk about this topic. But this is really the only thing I really do, <laughs> is take care of patients with sarcoidosis. I like to, Dr. Eichenhorn isn't here, but when he was chief of uh, pulmonary division, uh, he came to me, uh, I forgot what year it was, 2006, 2007, say, yeah, we want you to be the sarco doctor. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to be a one disease doc. You see, I'm all world. I don't want to just be tied down to one disease and one diagnosis. So I delayed that decision month after month after month. And when, when uh, day I was going to go to staff meeting, I said, nah, I'm not going to staff meeting. My wife heard me. She said, why aren't you going to staff meeting? I said, Dr. Eichenhorn is trying to make me be a one disease doc taking care of sarcoid patients. You know, I know a lot of stuff about everything. Oh, mostly. And she said, hmm, I want you to do that. After I gave her a brief, brief, brief description of what sarcoid was. She said, I want you to do that. And then she added this. And the Lord wants you to do it, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I knew better than to argue with my wife. That was good enough. But she threw the Lord in on it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> so... I told like, Dr. Eichen, I said, you know, uh, I, I, maybe I don't know enough about sarcoid when I think about it. So Dr. Burke was finishing his fellowship, Rob Burke, I don't know if you remember him or not, but uh, we decided to take a trip down to Cincinnati and talk to one of the sarcoid gurus, Dr. Robert Diamond, who's at the University of Cincinnati. And that was where we learned a lot about the uh, sarcoid group and this group here, the World Association of Sarcoid and Granulomatous Disease. And I got involved in that by uh, another crazy way. A patient came in to see me for sarcoidosis, and the first question is, oh, are you going to the Wasog meeting? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, what is Wasog? <laughs> and so I, I went into my office after she left, found out what Wasog was, and I went to their first meeting that was uh, actually in a very nice place in uh, Athens, Greece, uh, for the world. That's where I met a lot of the people who I uh, learned a lot from regarding sarcoidosis. This, this topic will be dealing with these topics here, past, present, and future, changing definition, changing uh, suspected etiologic agents, pathogenesis, diagnostic procedures, and changing treatment modalities. Historical development of sarcoidosis, originally named after uh, Besner, Beck, and Schaumann, had a complicated history describing their cases. At three periods, early observations, 1877 and 1915, systemic disease, 1915 to 1953, and description of stages and activity of disease, since 1953 up to the day and present, and we're still working on that. This is a sarcoidosis of the skin described by Hutchinson in 1877. There's good old Dr. Hutchinson. Milestones, first account of skin lesions, Bessner coined lupus perennial. Uh, Beck coined the term multiple benign sarcoid. Uh, Dr. Jungling and all described bone changes. Uh, Dr. Herford. Recognized uveitis in 1910. Shaman again, multisystemic disorder. And Vitor described lung lesions and others affected other organs. He, since Dr. Beck in 1899 published his work called Multiple Benign Sarcoid of the Skin. And here's a description of what he had to say. The histology is unique. There's areas of new growth might be described as periovascular sarcomatoid tissue. Vitor excessive rapid proliferation of epithelial or connective tissue cells and perivascular lymph spaces with little addition to other varieties. True giant cells of sarcomatous type are found. As preliminary name for the clinical and histological type, here he described as multiple benign sarcoid. Perhaps we still find this suitable. There's good old Dr. Herford who described the neuritis optica, keratitis, paresis, and infection of joints, later called uveoferotic fever of Herford. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the uh, uh, the patients who have that type of entity. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. 1991 description included the following. Multisystemic disorder of unknown cause mainly affects young and middle-aged adults, frequently presents with bilateral hyaluronopathy, pulmonary infiltration, ocular and skin lesions, liver, spleen, lymph nodes, salivary glands, heart, nervous system, muscles, bones, and other organs may also be involved. This, this diagnosis, this, this description and definition of, of sarcoid is changing a little bit because lately with the advent of uh, the 
skills of Dr. Simoff and his group with the EBUS biopsy. I've been finding I have about 10 elderly white men who come in with the characteristic findings on the x-ray. If I look at the x-ray, they got right peritracheal bilateral hyalur. Some of the, and this group does this thing, and they all come up with uh, lesions suggesting sarcoidosis. They're asymptomatic, so they do not require any treatment, thank goodness. So I think that uh, we'll have to expand this, this definition of uh, clinical types of patients that we see with this, this entity. So again, definition of sarcoid. Multisystemic disorder of unknown etiology, heightened by helper T cell type, TH1 immune response, at sites of disease activity, and by the presence of non case any granulomas. Occurs in all age groups, preferably in young, middle-aged adults, peaking in 20 to 29. Variants, 1 to 40 to 100,000 people. The incidence and prevalence of sarcoidosis is noted in uh, this slide here. You can look at the different countries where you, you see the incidence and the prevalence. Um, uh, Japan doesn't have a high incidence, but if you, let's see who can uh, earn 50 cents. In Japan, if you have sarcoidosis, what organ is likely involved? You owe me fifth cent. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take my fifth cent? Heart. The Japanese have a high incidence of cardiac sarcoidosis. I'm not sure if that'll be a board question, but it's good to remember that. In Japan? Yes. What is new in epidemiology? Well, not a whole lot, but uh, this is looked at in its access studies by Bauman and all in the American Journal of restored medicine, and then you can look at the statistics here, peak age 35 to 40, one third 55 in women older, blacks more extra thoracic, more severe lung disease, women higher dense incidence of erythema nodosum, ocular neurological disease, occupation environment exposure with increased risk, musty odors, insecticides, air conditioning, raising birds, employment in agriculture, teaching and others, smoking, strong negative predictor. So this is, I guess it's a good thing about smokers. They don't likely get uh, sarcoidosis. Of course, they get other bad stuff, but they may, be, may preferably get sarcoidosis. I'm going to look at the changing uh, suspected etiologic agents. Please feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions. Sarcoid etiology. There are people who we think are ge genetically susceptible. Uh, there's a genotype that we'll talk about in a minute. And, so, and there is a belief that there is some exposure to some specific environmental a agents. I remember when I was a medical student, there was a congregation of patients with sarcoid around Virginia and North Carolina, and they thought it was related to pine pollen, tree pine pollen. That, that didn't turn out to be much of anything, but, but this, these are how the things uh, get suspected and get looked at. Again, they can get discarded or promoted along the line. And th then you produce a sarcoid uh, clinical phenotype. HLA types and sarcoid, there is some protective alleles that seem to be uh, showing up in uh, people who study the, uh, the uh, this type of thing and the susceptible alleles. And you see the DR9 in Japanese patients who have the cardiac sarcoid. Now, this is interesting because when we have patients with Lofgren syndrome, you've always learned that patients that come with Lofgren syndrome will likely have a benign course. The disease is most likely done by two years. You don't have to do anything. When they come in, you go, oh yeah, you got this benign form of sarcoid. It takes some aspirin, Motrin, and give them a well place there. They're well, well now, now, and they're going to be fine. And these are the presentations. Bilateral lymphadenopathy, arthritis, erythema nodosum, most common in women. Frequently have fever, myalgia, malaise. 85% resolved in two years. And there's a good phenotype. 99% resolution. But I have a few patients who have this other phenotype. 55% resolution, and they are most miserable. They have the most severe forms of sarcoidosis in terms of chronic fatigue, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, small fiber neuropathy, headaches, this, that, and other, and just feeling miserably like 90 to 100% of the time. And this is without significant pulmonary finding. If these are normal, then they have a few little lymph nodes in the chest, but they are uh, most miserable. And there is no effective therapy that we have for them. And this is, again, describing the resolution of the people who have the Lofgren syndrome. Then we have Herford syndrome. It's an unusual manifestation mm -hmm. of sarcoidosis. It was described by Christian Herford in 1909 called Phoebus uveo parodia subchronica. Oh, my goodness. 
Patients present with uveitis, parotid swelling, cranial nerve palsy, fever, and incomplete uh, Herfer syndrome is also described. It's more common also in Japan than in Scandinavia. What are the potential causative agents of sarcoidosis? When we go to the uh, meetings, ASOG, which is the American Association of Sarcoid and Grand Homes, or WASOG, there's, a, there's two groups. There's uh, the group that says there's something environmental, so they get up and talk about environmental stuff, and then there's the hereditary group. Uh, they get up and present their data, and uh, so they've come to agreement that uh, we, they may be multifactorial. Could be related to infectious agents. You'll see a lot of literature in the internet, internet medicine, that talks about uh, it being an infectious agent, and uh, good old Dr. Marshall promotes the Marshall Protocol where he gives them some antibiotics, some of this and some of that, and Benicar and this and that and other. He claims to have success with that, but mm -hmm. I've had a couple of people who are on the Marshall Protocol, because that's not science, they have, they have not uh, done very well at all. Uh, they haven't done well with what I've been doing either, but they haven't done well with anything. Uh, but these are the agents that the one can, uh, that are composed to be related to sarcoidosis. I remember when I was a, a medical student, it was the, we talked about the pine tree pollen out of uh, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, in that area. The other thing, is, since it looks like tuberculosis, we have to consider the role of mycobacterial organisms, the role of propionobacterial actins, non-infectious agents such as beryllium, and the World Trade Center dust, and uh, other therapeutic agents and interferons. This is the mechanisms of granulomatous formation. You have an unknown antigen affecting the cells, as you see there, and going through all the enzyme release and things, and finally forming the epithelial yard cell that's been proposed uh, as the mechanism for developing the granulomas. We talked about these milestones before. Cutaneous energy has been seen by back in 1916 with the tuberculosis skin test. Uh, combined skin test is no longer used, but it, it, some people still have some of the combined reaction. Dr. I knew that he used to be here, uh, used to use it a lot. In fact, when he left, he, he took the combined that he had with him. So wherever he is, nobody can find him right now, but someplace up in New York, he has a, some, some combined stuff that's hanging around. I remember I received a call from somebody at another hospital and said, uh, uh, this patient that you guys been seeing down there uh, never had a biopsy for sarcoid. You can claim she has sarcoid. Yeah, she has sarcoid. And he said, yeah, but there's no biopsy. Oh, yeah, she had a biopsy. I looked went back and I had to go back and care plus no good. And I did that. And <laughs> looked up and there it was. Dr. I knew they'd seen it. Say, here, here's a combined test. Here's the results. So I said, oh, no, no, no. She had a combined test. It was positive. And I could tell the guy's age immediately on the other end of the phone. He was a young buck, probably just out of his fellowship. And he didn't know what a combined test was. I kept saying, she had a combined test. And he got, uh, well, she never had a biopsy. I got, no, she had a combined test. I said about three or four times. So I just, I'd say, you know, uh, this is conversation going to work. Click. <laughs> and hung up. <laughs> there was no way where I could convince him that that, that was going to be good enough. So he's going to send her for another biopsy. Well, you got to do what you have to do, but uh, we're done here. Then in 1977, we started looking at the bronchial alveolar volume lymphocytes increase, spontaneous lymphokine production in BEL cells by Honey Hockey in 1980, Adams and Sharma. Hypercalcemia caused by calciferol production from AM. I have to mention Dr. Sharma. Sharma Dr. Sharma was at the uh, University of Southern California. A uh, very, uh, very nice time. He, he uh, had a whole nice program going for, for sarcoidosis and well respected. And uh, when I met him over in uh, Greece when I went there, he's one of the nicest people that I've ever met in my life. He's no longer with us right now, but we, there a lot of people when we go to the meetings, they always have a big picture of him and paying homage to Dr. Om, Om Sharma which is quite appropriate. Uh, first description of hypercalcemia in 1939, etc. I'm not going to go through a lot of this right now. Changing dogmas before BAL, sarcoidosis and immune deficiency disorder. In 1962, good and all, grouped together, immunological deficiencies in diseases. I mean, uh, agamma globulinemia, hypogamma globulinemia, Hodgkin's disease, and they threw in sarcoidosis as well. Immunology and sarcoidosis is uh, this discrepant data before the DAL area. Uh, there was a supposedly cutaneous energy. Histologically, granulomas as an immunological type 4 reaction. T lymphocytopenia, energy in the peripheral blood. Increase in activated T lymphocytes in peripheral blood. Serum immunoglobulin levels increase. 
and decrease antibody formation by B cells after simulation in vitro. This is a description of the proposed mechanism for alveolitis that's sometimes seen in sarcoidosis. I won't spend a lot of time on going through all that. Compartmentalized immune response in sarcoidosis involve organs, CH1 type, uh, interleukin 2, interferon, and gamma, interleukin 12, and interleukin 18. Peripheral blood shows energy to tuberculosis and reduced T cells. The granuloma evolution is talked about in this slide. There's resolution, if it's, and then later on, if it's chronic disease, it goes into fibrosis. There's no single diagnostic test for sarcoidosis. Non-Cajun granuloma in a single organ such as skin do not establish the diagnosis of sarcoid, so there has to be some clinical association with the biopsy. Such granulomas are not specific for sarcoid. There has to be compatible clinical and radiological pictures, histological demonstration of non-Cajun granulomas, exclusion of other diseases capable of producing a similar histological and clinical picture. Now, there are times when I've had patients who have such overwhelming clinical evidence of sarcoid, I may not have recommended uh, a biopsy. But most of the time, they're going to need that. So the diagnostic approach is you get the clinical picture, chest radiograph, a CT, suggest sarcoidosis, choose appropriate biopsy site, that that's easily accessible. So you have to do a good clinical evaluation of the skin, lip, nasal mucosa, conjunctiva, peripheral lymph node, and then if necessary, bronchoscopy, transmarca biopsy, mucosa, BAL, transmarca needle aspiration. It is a systemic disease, it's a complex multiple system organ disease with multiple non-specific symptoms and other involvement which go beyond the user experiences of some chest physician. Here you see the, the skin, the eye, the bone, and the, the lungs. Uh, of these symptoms that involve in this slide, what do you think would be the worst clinically? The eye, it, it could be, but it's usually not. Because most of the time when people have eye problems, they, these can go to the ophthalmologist and give them some steroid eye drops to put them on some other crazy medication, and we can take care of that for the most part. Bone. Bone is, we, and we haven't found anything that really uh, alleviates any bone sarcoidosis or the symptoms we use associated with bone disease. So when someone comes in, we discover they have bone disease, I have that, that sinking feeling in my heart. Like, what are we going to do here? Now, we may have some some new medicines that are on the horizon that may help take care of that, but I haven't had any patient who has been on any of the newer medications that we use for that uh, just yet. But I got another, I had a patient just recently who had MRI positive for brain, spine, thoracic spine, lower spine, and, and lower legs. And uh, the radiology department did a biopsy, because, I mean, I said, she has sarcoid, and I go, that is the positive MRI, you've got sarcoid. But we went ahead and did a bone biopsy and it came out non caging and granular moment. The question is, is uh, not that we know that, what, what medicine do I have to give her that may affect her <coughs> miserableness? Because they usually are very miserable. Uh, just to digress, it just a little while. Back in the day, I had another lady who came in with that, and I mean, she had been on prednisone, methotrexate, and all the other stuff by the time she got to me. So the only thing I had to offer her was Remicade and Infliximab. So I put on Infliximab for a year, no change in symptoms. Not. So we, we just stopped that and now we have this other medicine that we, we talk about a little bit later that we might be able to, to get for her. The other thing is that happens in a lot of patients is overwhelming fatigue in about 70% of patients. Fever can occur, weight loss, some fever of unknown origin should always consider sarcoidosis as the cause. As I said before, fatigue is a major problem. And you have Dr. Sharma back in 1999 described all the fatigue that these patients can have. Early morning fatigue, intermittent fatigue, afternoon fatigue, post-sarcoidosis chronic fatigue syndrome. And including that is fibromyalgia. Uh, and also we have to add now that we have the tools to diagnose it with a skin biopsy. Send them to the neurologist, they do a skin biopsy, and again, they find these lesions called small fiber neuropathy. <laughs> there is no effective treatment for that. But at the Cleveland Clinic, they're uh, researching using IV gamma globulin, which is very expensive. And I'm not sure if it's producing any benefit just yet, but I'll find out in a week or so because I'll be meeting with uh, the lead author of, of that study, Dr. Dan Culver, out of the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, 
This is uh, from Madeline Drent, who uh, the Netherlands member of the World Association of Sarcoid and Ganglomas Disease. So she produced this slide and just talked about the different aspects of the disease that are outlined here. The changing tools for diagnosing sarcoidosis, skin biopsy. Uh, if you have a lesion, uh, the dermatologists here are really good at doing that. Uh, X-ray stages, metastinoscopy, transmarker biopsy, BAL, high resolution CT, and EBIS with uh, trans uh, bronchial needle aspiration. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this. Everybody knows the classical hyaluronopathy, right pericracial, diffuse lung disease, both, and then stage four sarcoidosis. An example of the lymph nodes, widened right paratracheal spikes, etc. I always get excited about that. And if you notice in our x-ray conference, we have a lot of patients that come up with those findings. Uh, so you should never always include sarcoidosis in, uh, in most of those uh, x-rays that look like that. There used to be a time when we did BALs a lot, and you, there was a, this ratio that was quoted as being uh, not conclusive, but suggestive of sarcoidosis, the CD4 to CD8 ratio. And there are things that was greater than 3.5, by Dr. Costabile, uh, I think he's out of Spain, he had a sensitivity of about 60% and 92% specificity. Rating in four, you can see the numbers there. And by uh, the Wasag uh, author, 55 and 94%. Uh, some places are still doing BALs for, for sarcoid, but I don't, I don't think we, uh, I don't think I've seen anybody for a BAL here for, for that diagnosis in the last few years. There's increased lymphocytes, however, in 90% of the patients who have active disease, and the range is from 20 to 80%. Clinically inactive disease, they have a mean less than 30%, and neutrophils may be increased in later or advanced disease. Percent biopsy of an involved organ, you uh, can see the numbers there. Uh, now, when we talk about organ involvement, we're gonna move over to this phase of uh, the presentation. Um, Someone who might have cardiac sarcoidosis, the test is a MRI. Now, what are the symptoms that would suggest cardiac involvement? There may be one. That's one. What else? Right. Yeah, arrhythmia. How are you going to find arrhythmia? Pardon? You may not find it on the EKG. So, what we would do is do a, at least a 48 hour hold monitor. Some people may require longer hold monitor. But, so if they have chest pain by itself, I would order a hold monitor, 48 hours. If they have chest pain and palpitation, it's very specific. I'm, I'm gonna go right to an MRI of the heart because they have a higher incidence of cardiac stroke if they have both of those complaints together. And sometimes they don't have it, but most of them will have cardiac sarcoidosis if they have that. Uh, there's some people looking at PET scans, but if you can't get that approved for sarcoidosis or anything in the United States. They get it approved in the Netherlands a lot for, for, for sarcoid-related disease, and, and we're trying to figure out how to get it approved because that would tell us a lot about <laughs> other sites that may be involved that are not symptomatic. But it's, it, it's hard to get it uh, authorized for that reason. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, I've seen a lot of these patients, 65% of the patients. That's why heparin is source there. There's Sarah sitting over thinking on her phone. <laughs> when, when she was a fellow, she was going to do pulmonary hypertension. I said, that's been great. You can do pulmonary hypertension and sarcoid <laughs> at the same time. Eh, she turned me down. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm, I still remember that. <laughs> I forgot, you doing pulmonary hypertension too? Oh, I, I know he's on Sarko. I'm glad about that too. I'm getting old, man. <laughs> uh, this is the, from the access study. 80% showed improvement in chest X-ray PFT after two years of uh, including those who were treated and untreated. Black centers showed less improvement and developed new organ involvement when they had sarcoidosis. And if you have a patient, this is the classic way we follow them up, the clinical examination, checking for symptoms, chest radiograph, lung function test spirometry, serum ACE level. And it's not that good, but it's about the only two we have. There's really no other test that we have for that, and occasionally high-resolution CT. 
Yeah, we don't recommend a BL anymore like we're used to, so we just we just knock that off the slide. Just, that slide is very old, so we don't do that unless we can think of something else is going on. Uh, now, follow up in this research. These are research activities that can can and should be done. Uh, lung function. Uh, Dr. Morris and I were talking about what were we talking about in terms of pulmonary function and lies patient cardiopulmonary exercise testing was it? That may be a good thing to consider doing in uh, a lot of these patients, particularly those who have some X-ray changes, and particularly those who have stage four disease. I think we can. Uh, that we, no, no, nobody has looked at that in a consistent way, so we have some opportunities there. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Changes on x-ray, symptom scores, quality of life scores, six-minute walk test is also important, and the sarcoidosis severity score has to be developed and other biomarkers. We only have one right now, and it's not, none of my any really that good, and that's the uh, serum ACE level. I use, uh, what test would you use for a patient who has sarcoidosis coming to your clinic? I mean, you've got all the clinical features, x-ray suggests you don't have a biopsy yet, so what testing would you do to assess that patient? Pardon? Yep, that's one. Uh, Vitamin D. CRP. CRP. I give you that one already. What else? Ace. Ace. I do that. What else? No, no, no. This is blood test. Yeah, we can come to that in just a second. Yeah. What else? If you're going to order vitamin D, Auto 125 dihydroxy vitamin as well. And uh, the data on that was actually done by Dr. Burke and uh, in the phenology department here that they have uh, high, tend to have higher levels of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D and a low vitamin D. Said rate CRP and the uh, those things. That's, that's, that's the minimum test that I do on a new patient. Uh, I don't follow the ACE level, things like that, because it doesn't correlate that well. If you, if you give somebody a prednisone tablet, the ACE will drop. It doesn't mean anything in terms of uh, symptom complex. Follow-up, stage one disease. I had a, we had a great fellow here some years ago, and he was seeing his all of his soccer patients every two months. I said, why do you follow them every two months? He said, well, the guidelines say to follow them, follow them that way. I said, no, 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 no. No, they need stage four disease before you need more frequent follow-up. But stage one disease, stage two disease, and don't see for asymptomatic, you know, some of those patients can be seen every six months or every year. Other stages, every three to six months, follow-up minimal three years after the therapy is discontinued. If the radiograph is normalized after three years, subsequent follow-up is not routinely required unless they have some problems. Follow-up needs to be more vigilant after corticosteroid-induced remission than after those who have spontaneous remission. That brings up a discussion I had with... Uh, my, one of my first sarcoid patients during my fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. He was a uh, uh, 29 year old white male who came in. He had potato lesions all over his chest, big masses all over the place. And I said, okay, we need, he got his PFT and all that kind of stuff, got the biopsy. And uh, we recommended he go on steroids. And we, we decided that he would need 40 milligrams of prednisone. Nobody's using much methotrexate at that time. Well, he, he's. He said, he said, oh, he took the prescription. Then he never showed back. Never showed back for, for almost a year. Came back in and said he never took anything. Got his repeat chest x-ray, everything was gone. Just spontaneously improved. And here I was thinking we're going to get credit for it for the treatment. We didn't, get, we didn't need to take anything. He just got better. God just blessed him and got him better. Uh, that, that can and happen on, in some of our patients. Do you see that nodular sarcoid? Yes, typically speaking. Now, treatment, which patient, which drug, mm -hmm. what dose, what tapering, what duration, and which assessment? Spontaneous remissions, remember, occur in 60 to 70 percent. Chronic or progressive course in 10 to 30 percent. Serious extracurricular involvement at presentation, 4 to 7 percent. Permanent sequela, 10 to 20 percent. And mortality, 1 to 5 percent. Those who have severe respiratory disease, central nervous system and cardiac disease. And uh, after Bernie Mac died, I had a huge influx of patients come to see me for sarcoid. Even if they didn't have sarcoid, they thought they might have sarcoid, they were making appointments to see me. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh. <laughs> smack him. Do me a favor. Smack him. Just smack him. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if I have it here, but there is some incidence of recurrence of disease, which is typically not as symptomatic as it was the first go-round. Exactly. Right. So, so always, I mean, everybody does not need treatment. That's that's the key. You treat those who need to be treated, and you treat them for a period of time, usually no more than two years, because most will respond by that time, either spontaneously or with the medication, somehow or progress to other diseases. Now, going back to the notables, we talked about Bernie Mac. There's uh, Bill Russell, the famous. Uh, Boston Celtic Center has sarcoidosis. Reggie White died with sarcoidosis. The all, uh, all pro defensive mm-hmm. tackle. And so there's, there's a lot of people out there. You know, when, when some notable person dies, there's a big influx of patients coming in. I got sarcoid. I need to be seen. You know, so just deal with it as we as we have to. Can you talk about this already? Treatment indication for extrapulmonary heart arrhythmias insufficiency, eye. The eye is probably one of the simplest things to do most of the time. Make sure that your patients see the eye doctor at least once every year. Because, uh, you know, you can't just look at the eye and say, oh, you got sarcoid in there. They have to do the slip knife examination and things of that nature. Treatment most of the time can be responsive to steroid eye drops. Some require more advanced therapy. So, uh, when this uh, new lady came to Bo- Beaumont Hospital, Dr. Fia, uh, all of a sudden, I was getting an influx of sarcoid patients with uh, uveitis, and I never met her. I don't know how they start coming. She said I must have looked up on the internet or something. And so I was just getting patients from Bowman, just rolling in, rolling in, one after the other. And she wanted one thing. What did she want? They all had uveitis. No. <laughs> no. See that? They didn't want steroid. I mean, they, they, they can do that right down the street at, at, Bo- at Beaumont. But she wanted them all on Remicade, Infliximab. And most of them required Infliximab because they'd been on all the other stuff. So I had a whole cadre of, of uh, Beaumont patients from Dr. Pia who were on Infliximab. And uh, they got uh, easy um, authorization to, to take that medication. So that is one of the indications for that medication to use in that, in that entity. Neurosarcoid, uh, I, I hate it when they come with a neurosarcoid. I had a patient, let me describe this patient, he was at um, one of our local hospitals, but not where they see a lot of sarcoid. His sisters called me and said, uh, my brother's over at this hospital, north of you guys, and I don't think they do a lot of sarcoid out there. I said, yeah, they probably don't. And she said, I, I, I think you've got sarcoid, because he's acting crazy, and they said, no, they want to send him to a nut house. And I said, she said, will you take him? So I had him transfer it down to F2, and I remember thinking about it. She said he was over receiving and seeing uh, a doctor who takes care of sarcoid patients. I said, this guy's got sarcoid. I can feel it. So <laughs> when he got the F2, I, told, I called down. I said, when he hit the floor, put him on 60 milligrams of prednisone. But we don't have anything. I said, put him on it. We can always stop it the next day or something like that. Um, but, but they had got an MRI of the brain over there, but they read it wrong. And when he came here, the guys from here reread it. And they showed uh, neurosarcoid. So his craziness went away as soon as about the third day of 60 milligrams of prednisone. And we finally weaned him off and got him down to some more respectable, reasonable dose. And he did fairly well in terms of his, uh, his uh, neurosarcoid. Hypercalcemia and hypercalceria, disfiguring skin lesions. <coughs> Indications for treatment of pulmonary sarcoidosis those who have symptoms, severe progressive functional impairment, progressive radiologic infiltration. Uh, we have had some patients who have undergone a lung transplant with uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis, and unfortunately some of these patients, I think we have two here, that they develop sarcoidosis into the transplanted lung as well. We don't understand how that happens, but uh, these patients are uh, on some dose of prednisone, and all of them are always on uh, infliximab as well, with some control of their symptoms, but not complete resolution. These are the recommended doses of uh, prednisone. We don't want to go higher than 20 to 40 milligrams when Dr. Burke was here. He would rarely use over 20 milligrams. Uh, I tend to stick with 30 to 20. I rarely go 40. I only use 60 if they have 
neurological sarcoidosis because what we don't want to produce, they already have sarcoidosis and we don't want to produce this other disease called steroidosis. That's just too many steroids. I see a lot of uh, doctors in the community, patients get CAT scans twice a year looking at their lymph nodes, they have no symptoms and the doctors is giving anywhere like uh, 20, 30, 40 milligrams of prednisone to treat the lymph nodes away. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of craziness going on out there. So we can like to continue therapy for a minimum of 12 months, and then after the continuation, follow the patients because they can they can relapse. Alternative drugs, azathioprine. These are the doses I find the most bang for the buck is with methotrexate in this dose range, along with some dose of prednisone. We give it because these are some so-called steroid sparing medication, hydroxychloroquine is rarely effective, but it, if you have nothing else and they can't take methotrexate, they can't take azofibrin, they want to do that, it's okay to give it a try, particularly if they have simply hypercalcemia and some mild skin rash and Plaquenil 400 milligrams a day. Uh, it takes a long time for it to work, but at least it's very, very safe. Azofibrin, if methotrexate doesn't work, azofibrin will most likely not work uh, in, in our clinic experience with the people at Wausau. But sometimes you have to give it because it's, most, it's helpful that we can document if they've been on these medications to say you had them on this medication for some period of time and then you can uh, get them uh, approved and authorized for more advanced therapies. Most of the therapies, yes? How do I transition from? No, I, most time, most of my patients are going to be on some dose of prednisone plus methotrexate because we find to, uh, statistically that they, there's a big bang for the buck. You may start at high doses of prednisone. A lot of times I start them both together, just, just making a guess that they most likely will need two drugs and prednisone alone is not going to work. So I start them on two, both drugs together, get down the prednisone to five or ten a day if possible. Usually five is better than ten. Well, it depends on their clinical response. If they have a rapid clinical response, I move it quick. But most time, the, the most of the therapies we need to assess them in three month intervals, because that's when you sort of look at changing dose, stopping the dose, and moving them on to something else. So it takes about three months. Every now and then, you get somebody who responds dramatically right away, but that rarely occurs. So three month intervals is uh, is how we look at most of these these medications. If they haven't responded to prednisone, methotrexate, and three months, they're not going to respond. So stop that and go to something else. Same thing with infliximab and some of the other ones. Three months, if they're not better, done. Uh, so that's a pretty good, we've sort of accepted that three month criteria as a time to change dose, change medication for almost all the patients that we see. When you put them on infliximab as a dose, do you stop the exact or you keep it down? No, I usually stop it. <laughs> there are a couple of times you, you have to keep something going on, some immunosuppression going on because if they had been on, say for example, infliximab before, and stopped it some years ago because they got so much better. You think you need to restart it. There is, uh, they build up these things called uh, human anticholinergic antibodies. I used to be to order that and get the results, but not, but it's so costly that the hospital won't, won't let me order that anymore. I mean, I can order they just won't do it. And they call them HECA antibodies. So you find that they have these HECA antibodies, and you take them better, better put them on some methotrexate and it's on four four weeks before you start to inflict some ab or medication similar to that because then they'll have a bad reaction and, and it's not good. I had one patient who I suspected had that and I, I said, okay, before you start taking this medication, uh, please take prednisone methotrexate low dose. She didn't take it. So she goes down to the chemo room and she's having an allergic reaction down there. I said, well, what happened? Did you take it? No, I didn't take it. I was scared. You're done. And she has lupus perennial will look like Doug W.C. Fields and big masses on her face and she's, she's, but there's nothing you can do. She just didn't take the medication. So, so obviously she, she doesn't see me anymore because I have nothing to offer. This is the response rate to methotrexate. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful that we get such a halfway decent response out of methotrexate at the doses we use because it's, it's been proven to be pretty safe. So, so if you have a patient on methotrexate, how would you monitor this patient to make sure they're not going to be having methotrexate toxicity. 
as one of them you do. What else? I'm not worried about the liver so much. But you can do it if you wish. What should you be worried about? Kidney function. So there's a standard protocol to get check that every three months. CDC, lights, checking it for renal function every three months for about a year, and then you can go there every six months if they still want it and, and have no problems. Now we get to the biologic agents. You know, they got the internocep, infliximab, and Humira. The best bang for the money is the infliximab. But every time you can't always get that authorized, so you may go to Humira. I haven't had any patients on Eternocept at all. But some people use that. And uh, the rheumatologists use a lot of different ones. And this one, you use that one, and that one, you use this one, and things of that nature. Uh, uh, so I don't have any comment with regard to their anti TNF activity and their response to sarcoidosis. The biggest uh, thing that most of us use in the Wasslock group is the infliximab. And uh, this might be a board question somewhere along the line. When is infliximab the most successful in patients with sarcoidosis? There's grade one level evidence for this. Published out of University of South Carolina by Mark Judson and all. Lupus perennial. I have some flies in here. If you have lupus perennial, I don't, I don't waste time going through the other stuff. If, make sure they have. Now, what are the two things you need to know about uh, infliximab? If you're going to use infliximab, what do you need to know about the patient before you even write it? TB, what else? Hepatitis. So you have to run a hepatitis panel and the quantiferin or PPD skin test. If that's negative, then you can go ahead. Because if you don't do that, guess what you've done? You basically killed the patient. That's it. There's nothing you can do once you do that. Uh, I, I've never had that happen, but uh, and as we speak, here's a patient with lupus perennial, and so a few weeks after treatment, two weeks after the first dose of the catheter, face respond. Usually, they respond dramatically. Very similar to that. So that is necessary later on, after the fourth dose of infliximab. Usually about three to four, but you keep it going for a while. But then the way I write for infliximab is you give uh, two doses two weeks apart, and then every four weeks after that. Now when they're stable, I find it better not to stop it, because trying to get it restarted again and reauthorized again is a pain in the, you know, whatever that is. But <laughs> So what you do is you stretch it out. You know, if they're doing great, and uh, every two, three, four weeks for three or four times, I say, okay, well, let's go to every eight weeks. And if they're doing great, every 12 weeks. But I tend not to try to stop it because once you stop, you gotta go all over again and uh, move from there. And they, they're pretty set to that. Oops. I wasn't gonna talk about Actar, but I do have a few minutes and I'll talk about that. But so, so the basic thing, I had a slide here, I don't know what happened to it, but the basic thing is the, the most of the time people, if you need treatment, it's going to be methotrexate, or uh, prednisone, I'm sorry, is the first line of therapy. The next thing that you add is uh, methotrexate, you may add uh, one of the other agents, and then I usually go to infliximab or something like that for the treatment if, if necessary, depending on the situation and clinical disease. If it's uh, lupus perennial, I just go directly to infliximab. I don't waste time to find it see if the, uh, the other stuff is going to work. It's not going to work. So uh, I, don't, I didn't have a prepa I didn't have prepared talk. I just had that on the end of the slide. So there's a whole another talk with regard to the use of uh, this, this medication called ACTH that was actually FDA approved for, for this uh, disease in 1952. But 1952, Axar was approved for the treatment of uh, sarcoidosis. But then a year or so after that, guess what came on board? Pregnism. So why, why should we be taking injections and giving injections when we can just take a pill? And it made sense. But at that time, I don't think they knew all of the benefits. They did not know all the benefits of Actar. Actar has uh, 
some other anti-inflammatory properties that have been uh, being worked on and looked at now, but we do have some data from Dr. Bauman and some others that uh, have people been on prednisone and all the other medication, and they did a study looking at use of Actar gel in these patients, and a lot of them had further improvement in their disease state without the uh, side effects of, of steroids. Now, why and how that occurs, I have no idea. I don't, nobody understands the pathophysiology or the, patho uh, the physiology of how this works, but they do know that there's five other melanocortical receptor sites uh, that are affected by the use of this medication. It's very expensive, but I have, uh, I have a number of patients that are on this medication and doing quite well with it. And they're not having the side effects of prednisone. Uh, and Dr. Bauma said I don't have it here, so I can't show you, but I can talk about it a little bit, is that even though the patients, some of them didn't have complete improvement, they were all able to reduce their high doses of prednisone down to a, a low level. But, so that's worth something because they didn't have uh, steroidosis from the ACTAR, but they got rid of steroidosis from the prednisone. But a lot of them did have significant improvement. So there's, there'll be more to come with regard to the use of of uh, this medication, but just to say it is FDA approved and 